When you go to Disneyland, you often feel like you can expect quality, thrills, immersion, storytelling, things that other theme parks, well, for the most part now up until like next summer, don't really do as well as Disney. You got people lining up at 7 a.m. just to get a shot at riding Flight of Passage or Seven Dwarfs Mine Train, Rise of the Resistance. These attractions are what are known as e-tickets, big blockbuster attractions that everybody wants to ride that usually have a wait time of over, you know, 45 minutes, an hour. Rides like Radiator Springs Racers or Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind. These are the big marquee attractions, but in their race to go ride the Seven Dwarfs Mine Train or Mission Breakout, a lot of people walk past the smaller e-tickets. I guess that would be a, a D ticket, but uh, smaller than that even. Rides and attractions that are overlooked, that a lot of people don't really give a second thought to. Rides that I would consider underrated. And today I wanted to shine a bit of a spotlight on these underappreciated attractions. Rides that may not contain a loop-de-loop -loop or cutting edge effects, but are just as entertaining, if not more so, than their big budget neighbors. Now I have this sort of like running bit on my channel where we overappreciate underappreciated attractions like the People Mover, like living with the land. And that's not a running joke on my channel because I would never joke about liking living with the land too much. It is the best ride at Walt Disney World, but we are going to be shining a light on some attractions that I never really talk about on this channel. Some that I think really do deserve some appreciation at both Walt Disney World and Disneyland. So no matter what coast you're on, you'll be able to watch this video and empathize with what I'm I'm going to say. However, number one on this list is a bit different than the others, and I'll explain once we arrive to it, but you'll see what I'm talking about. So I guess without any further ado, we'll just hop right into it and go to my favorite park at Walt Disney World, Epcot. But not to the ride you think. We're not talking about that ride in this video, because it's the best. It's not underrated. It's perfectly rated, because everyone knows how good it is. Now first things first, I am mainly a Future World fan, I guess now it would be World Discovery, World Nature, and World Celebration fan, but this entry takes us to the World Showcase, more specifically to the first or last pavilion, depending on which side you start on, Mexico. Now I love the Mexico Pavilion. It's one of the only World Showcase pavilions that's almost entirely indoors, and as someone from Colorado, it sort of reminds me in a fun and interesting way of Casa Bonita up in Denver. But what really matters here isn't the shops or La Cava del Tequila, although La Cava is a great time. We're talking about the Grand Fiesta Tour starring the three caballeros, Panchito, Jose, and Donald. Duck. I mean, the thing that should be enough to convince you all is that it's a boat ride. It's a classic Pirates of the Caribbean style boat ride. No drops, just a nice lazy ride down a river of time, although that's the old name for the attraction. It's, it's, it's Grand Fiesta Tour now. It used to be El Rio del Tiempo. And while I think it's fun to follow Panchito, Jose, and Donald through these various scenarios throughout all of Mexico and look at all the vintage video clips they have playing throughout the attraction, my favorite part of the Grand Fiesta Tour is the very beginning. While you're sailing past the erupting volcano, the Mayan Pyramid, and the San Angel Inn, which is the indoor, almost sort of blue bayou style restaurant in the Mexico Pavilion. And that's mainly why I love this very first scene of the attraction, because it really does evoke Disneyland's Pirates of the Caribbean. There's not really any overwhelming music playing, you can just enjoy the sound of the water and the people dining and just look around at this beautifully created scene that is, at night, just like pirates. Before, at the end of the scene, you sail into an old Mayan ruin, and then the real attraction begins, you know, with Donald, Panchito, and Jose. Speaking of, their animatronics at the end of this attraction, the grand finale, are also really impressive and remnants of a forgotten and extinct Magic Kingdom attraction. The Mickey Mouse Review was an attraction that sat where Mickey's PhilharMagic can be found today, and was an animatronic music show, similar to, say, the Tiki Room, or I guess more appropriately, the Country Bear Jamboree where different animatronics of classic Disney characters would sing songs from their movies. And these animatronics included Panchito, Donald, and Jose from Saludos Amigos. When the attraction closed in 1980, most of the animatronics were sent back to storage or scrapped for parts, but three survived and were redressed, refitted, and placed into the Grand Fiesta Tour. And you can find them performing to this day, except for that one weird time when like they were missing and nobody knew what happened and they built that like shrine to Donald on the stage. It was a whole thing. It was a, uh, That was an age of Disney Park social media, let me just say. But just a nice way to get out of the heat and enjoy a classic boat ride with some good animatronics and an amazing opening scene. The Grand Fiesta Tour is, in my opinion, underrated. 
Oh, would you, would you look at that? It's an absolute downpour outside. The gods don't want me to tell you about number four on this list, but this isn't going to stop me. No, we are going to talk about one of the best attractions at Critter Country at Disneyland. Now, you think Critter Country, you think of the attractions they have there, the rides. you got the mini adventures of Winnie the Pooh, you have Tiana's Bayou Adventure, and you have... But there's another one? Yeah, the Davy Crockett Explorer Canoes. The Davy Crockett Explorer Canoes are one of the most unique attractions you can find at any of the Disney parks anywhere. And it's not on a track. You are in a canoe just paddling around the rivers of America, dodging the Mark Twain and the Columbia and the rafts from Tom Sawyer's Island. It's amazing. It's an experience in of itself. And I highly, highly recommend you check it out. You know, something funny about the Explorer Canoes, it's the only attraction that has been in three separate lands at Disneyland since it opened without ever actually having moved location. It opened in 1956 as part of Frontierland, then was absorbed into Bear Country when Bear Country opened in 1972, and then when Bear Country became Critter Country in 1989, the canoe's patron land changed alongside it, which is kind of silly. Now, this isn't like the Grand Fiesta Tour or, say, even living with the land where you can get out of the heat and relax. You don't get to relax on this ride, and if it's hot outside, you don't get to get out of the heat, but that's why it's the working man's attraction. You have to be brave, you have to be strong to ride this ride. But don't let that deter you. If it's a nice day outside and you want to do something a little bit different and really get out there onto the rivers of America because you you are like a foot off of the water, the Explorer Canoes are such a unique attraction and a historical Disney ride. You can see in that picture I showed earlier, in this picture I'm showing right now, Walt Disney himself went on this attraction. It opened in 1956, just after the rest of the park. So whether you're a history buff or you want to work out in the middle of your Disney Land Day workout, or maybe you just like being yelled at by cast members because they do yell at you, not in like an angry way, but just so everybody can hear. The Explorer Canoes are truly the attraction for you. Just don't go too crazy on that ride. No splashing, okay? Remember not to splash. Now this entry brings us back to Walt Disney World to Animal Kingdom. And you know, the icon of the park is really cool. It's a majestic giant tree called the Tree of Life that has different animals carved into its base. You can see them as you get closer. And if you get close enough, you get to go underneath the Tree of Life into a small theater that houses It's Tough to Be a Bug. Yeah, It's Tough to Be a Bug is three on this list. I love this attraction. And not just because it terrifies both children and adults alike, although that is 99% of the reason why I love this attraction. It's also just a really fun 4D show that, yes, gets you out of the heat and it will terrify both you and yours. And it also doesn't hurt that for some reason they went all out on the audio animatronics for this show. For some reason, this 4D show has some of the best animatronics you can see at Disney's Animal Kingdom, you know, ones that aren't doing the disco. The Hopper animatronic specifically is really impressive and like I said, terrifying. Have I mentioned that this show is absolutely terrifying right now? There's a disclaimer before you go into the theater that young children may find it disturbing, but they don't mention that adults also will find it disturbing. It's not the, the, the loud sounds or the flashing lights that necessarily make this disturbing. Maybe not even the Black Widow spiders that descend from the ceiling of the theater and nearly touch you, nearly graze your head. It's the fact that there's hardly ever a wait and the show is just absolutely full of bug puns. Oh, that and the fact that the bugs will crawl over and underneath you on your way out of the theater. It's an amazing time if you know what's coming. If you're not sure what to expect, you will be horrified. And what's really fun is watching everybody else's reaction if you have seen this show before, just to see the pure terror on their face. Is this... Is this a weird entry? Am I taking too much joy in other people's terror? It doesn't matter. It's a great 40 show with practical effects and there's hardly ever, ever a wait, which makes it by definition underrated. Now this show is meant at some point in the vague future to be replaced by a Zootopia themed show. And I can only hope, I'm not mad that they're bringing Zootopia in over It's Tough to Be a Bug, but I do really hope that they keep the scary aspect of the show in place. I hope It's Tough to Be an Animal or whatever is still just as scary and just as unnerving as It's Tough to Be a Bug. Otherwise, what's even the point? 
Now, as we are all familiar, I'm sure, Disneyland has the Mark Twain Riverboat, and I don't think that the Mark Twain is really underrated. I think it's perfectly rated. It is genuinely, like, medium-level popular. From what I can tell, unless it's, like, the first thing in the morning, there are always people on the Mark Twain riding it around the rivers of America. It's such a great attraction just to see Disneyland. It's a people mover after the people mover has, you know, just been sort of forgotten. But we're not talking about the Mark Twain for number two. No, we are staying at Walt Disney World, and instead we're talking about the Liberty Bell. Now, the Liberty Bell is Walt Disney World, or I guess Magic Kingdom's answer to Disneyland's Mark Twain. It's the very same attraction, different ships, obviously. They, I don't think they can go that fast. It's a steam-powered riverboat that guests can board and ride around the rivers of America. The very same as at Disneyland, except at Disney World, I feel like not a lot of people appreciate the Liberty Bell for the people mover that she is. And I really think this just sort of comes down to the difference in cultures at the Magic Kingdom versus at Disneyland. Whereas at Disneyland, you have a lot of locals, a lot of people willing to slow down, smell the roses, because if they don't get to ride a certain e-ticket or a huge attraction, they can just come back the next week or the next month and give it another shot. So they're more willing to go on these slower attractions like the Mark Twain. Whereas at Walt Disney World, they are going ride to ride to ride to dining reservation to ride to ride because maybe this is their one and only chance to to visit the Magic Kingdom in their lives, so I don't blame them for maybe not wanting to take a voyage upon the Liberty Bell. Now, I love the Liberty Bell for the very same reasons that I love the Mark Twain and that I love the People Mover and the Disneyland Railroad and the Walt Disney World Railroad. It's just a way to relax and unwind in the middle of the day. Maybe it's a little hot out, but you could sit on the lower decks, get some shade, just see the park from a different vantage point. From up above, if you're at the top deck, or maybe from down below, you get to see the rivers of America at Disney World world, that would be Liberty Square and Frontierland, maybe beyond Big Thunder Mountain when that expansion opens. It lets you see more of the park in a different way than you would normally be able to without having to do all of that walking. That is reason enough to get on board the Liberty Bell and just take it for a spin, maybe just once. If you've never done it, do it once on your next trip to the Magic Kingdom and let me know what you thought. And the best part is because it's sort of an, I hate to use this word, unpopular attraction, like it's tough to be a bug, like all of the other entries on this list, except for number one, because like I said, that one's different, it usually has a very short wait time. So the only time you're really in line is when you're waiting at the station for the Liberty Bell to return back. And unlike at Disneyland with the Disneyland Railroad that also circles the park, you do get some views on this steamboat that you do not get anywhere else. So you get some Liberty Bell exclusive views. If I haven't convinced you yet to go on this underrated attraction, um, I don't know what will. You're beyond my help in that case. Now, at long last, we are finally headed back to Disneyland for the number one entry on this list. An entry that is different, that is sort of different from the rest, if you've been paying attention. This one brings us specifically to Tomorrowland, to the back of the land. Not necessarily all the way back, that's the railroad. A little bit in front of it, though, to the Autopia. Now, I have become, in recent years, a sort of Autopia apologist. Earlier on into my YouTube ing. I was like some of you out there. I thought the Autopia was a tremendous waste of space. The sound, the gasoline smells, and the sheer footprint size of the attraction would be better lent to something else. Maybe Tron, maybe something brand new, but the Autopia just took up a lot of room and it wasn't that futuristic. It was just driving a car around. That's not really tomorrow. That's more like yesterday, today. But now, I don't know, it's so, sort of grown on me. The Autopia is one of my favorite attractions in Tomorrowland, not just because it's an opening day attraction, so there is some history there, but it does move people, and it's just a, a nice, fun, relaxing attraction. Now, this one is different because sometimes the standby does get up there. There are, at some point, sometimes, a lot of people waiting to go on the Autopia, although maybe it's not a lot of people and it's just a really, really really slow loader, that could be it, but you know, usually the line is decently long. But the sentiment that the Autopia has been aged out and it no longer belongs in Tomorrowland is sort of a growing one. One that I can certainly understand, but I just don't share. And recently, I don't know if you remember, there was some news released that the Autopia would be going fully electric. That gasoline scent and the sounds of the cars going round and round the track will no longer be a thing, allegedly, by, I believe, 2026, which is in the next two years here. Which shows me that, one, 
Disney has no immediate plans for New Tomorrowland anytime in the future because Autopia is staying. And two, that the Autopia is staying. It's the flip side of that coin. The Autopia survives another year or 10 or 70. So is the Autopia outdated? Yeah, absolutely. Does it belong in Tomorrowland? Maybe not. Does it take up way too much space and smell absolutely terrible? Yes. Do I like it? Also, yes. Does the common sentiment that Autopia needs to be ripped up and replaced with something else make it underrated? Maybe not necessarily, but this is my list and I can make the rules however I want to. That being said though, while this is my list, your voices don't have to go completely unheard of because there's a little thing called the comments section down below. I would like to hear what you think are the most underrated attractions at the Disney parks. Disneyland, California Adventure, Animal Kingdom, Epcot, Hollywood Studios, Magic Kingdom, doesn't matter. Any of the American or even overseas Disney parks, what's the most underrated attraction at Tokyo Disney Sea? Please be sure to let me know down in the comments below because I, I really want to ride and experience and appreciate all of these underrated attractions. Even if I do end up going overseas, I want to see what people think are the, the less loved attractions that deserve a little bit more love. And um, now, I believe we can go into number zero on the list, which is, of course... I mean, come on. Was there ever really doubt in your minds that this was going to be number zero at the top of the list? Also, this is the end card. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for watching this video on my top five most underappreciated, underrated Disney attractions. If you enjoyed it, please be sure to hit the like button. And if you're new around here, you want more videos like this, be sure to hit that subscribe button. This video was meant to come out actually next week as of you viewing this, but I had to recobble some stuff around, you know, reschedule some videos just to, to put this one out earlier for different reasons that were outside of anybody's control. But either way, I hope it didn't seem too rushed and cobbled together. I really did enjoy making it. A very big thank you, as always, to my supporters over at Patreon.com. They get early access to videos, not this one, unfortunately, because of the whole, you know, reshuffling videos around thing, but they do get early access to most of my videos, like 99.999% of them, and exclusive Patreon videos that only they can see. So if that sounds interesting to you, even just $1 a month will get you access to most of the perks. But if you'd rather follow me for free on other social media sites where you don't have to pay, I am on Twitter, Instagram, Instagram and TikTok as Offhand Disney at Offhand Disney. You can follow me over there for some sweet, sweet extra content. But everyone, that about wraps up this video. Thank you all again so much for watching. I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Probably a fun video, probably a historical video. We'll see. Goodbye.